following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. This series is based on two of the main scriptures of yoga. The first one is probably the most famous. It's called the Bhagavad Gita. And it's a scripture presented in the form of a dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna. The second scripture is called the Yoga Sutras. And is attributed to the author Patanjali. And of course, nowadays, yoga has become uh, world famous. But people think yoga is just about stretching and manipulating the physical body. So we're, we've been giving this course in order to explain the real meaning of yoga, what it really is, what it's really for, so that we can take advantage of these these scriptures, and also take advantage of our moment-to-moment -moment experience. Really, that's what yoga is about. It's about us. It's about who we are now. And not only that, yoga is about who we are becoming. How we use each moment and the results of that. So today we're at the sixth lecture of this course. And we've progressed through only about half of the first chapter of the Yoga Sutras. It's a short scripture. It only has four chapters. And almost nothing in there is about postures of the body. In fact, the whole scripture has been misunderstood by humanity. Even those who love yoga and study yoga probably have never heard of it, even though it's the root scripture of, of yoga. So in Sanskrit, we need to understand that the word yoga literally means union. It doesn't mean stretching. It doesn't have anything to do with postures. It means to unite. It, it implies a type of union that has nothing to do with the physical body, or at least very little. The word yoga implies something about truth, something about reality. When we look into the use of the word yoga in the ancient scriptures, the scholar or the student of those scriptures quickly discovers that this term yoga rarely has anything to do with physicality, but it's always concerned with attention, with consciousness. And this in itself points out the significant misunderstanding that exists in modern culture about yoga. This word union is describing a relationship between divinity and the human soul, the human consciousness, that in us which is real. So that human soul or human consciousness is not our body. 
It is not our vital energy. It is not our emotion. It is not our thoughts. It is our essence, our cognizance. It is that part of us that does not have a name, the way we think of names. It doesn't have our tastes, our interests, our habits. It is that part of us that is the root of perception and understanding. So if you look into yourself right now, in this moment, you'll feel your physical body. And you have the capacity to observe that body. And inside that body, you feel your energy, your relative energetic state. You're a little tired, a little active, a little sleepy, a little sick, a little uh, unhealthy, a little healthy, full feeling, cold heat, all the types of energetic qualities that you can feel. That's not your identity. Neither is the body itself. You can also sense emotion that come and go, seemingly on their own. And that also is not who you are. Because that emotional quality is constantly changing, constantly unreliable, fluctuates in according with the impressions that are hitting against it. Thoughts as well. Thoughts coming and going, sometimes subtle, sometimes strong, but contradicting each other. The thoughts that come and go have no consistency or reliability either. So how can you find self or real identity in thought? So in this manner, as you observe everything observable and you back away from all the observable phenomena in yourself, you eventually start to center in on something that is immutable, something that is ever there, that is ever present, ever available, and that is the ability to perceive. Not only perceive, but understand what is perceived. That element is what we call the human soul. Consciousness, if you want to put it that way. Essence. That part in us that we really don't pay much attention to, but is not the body, is not energy, is not thought, is not emotion, but it is will. That has a source. What gave it life? What gave it the ability to be in this body? and to experience energy and thought and feeling. When that can unite with its source, that is yoga. That's what's depicted in this image from the Mahabharata. This virginal woman perceives Surya, the sun god. He represents that light of the Ain Sof, Amitabha in Buddhism, that limitless intelligence that gives rise to all living things, and in in that way, gives rise to her, the human soul, us, ourselves, in our heart of hearts. This image depicts her seeing her root nature, unblemished, unconditioned, unfiltered. Most people see this type of image and they think, It's some woman seeing a god come down out of the clouds. That's only the literal level. That's not the meaning. The meaning is, this is an experience of the soul experiencing its true nature. Yoga is that. It is that experience. That's the purpose of yoga, is to help us understand, firstly, how to experience that for ourselves, so we don't have to believe in it, or theorize about it, but know it. And then secondly, how to sustain it, how to make it our permanent state, how to find what is preventing it from being our normal state. That's what yoga is about, real yoga, establishing that union on a permanent basis. So that's why in the first four lines of the Yoga Sutras, Patanjali wrote, Now instruction in union, 
Yoga is the stilling of the modifications of consciousness. The filters, in other words, the things that prevent yoga. Then awareness abides in its own nature. Otherwise, it is identified with the modifications. Our true nature is not outside of us. It is not in a school or a group or a master or a god. It isn't in a book. It is in us, spontaneously, naturally, already. We just don't see it because we are identified with what modifies our consciousness. This is the key that sets up the entire Yoga Sutras. And it's what Krishna is explaining in the entire Bhagavad Gita. And it is the basis of the entire Mahabharata, which is the greatest epic in world literature. The Bhagavad Gita is taken out of the Mahabharata. It's an excerpt. The whole Mahabharata, which means the great warrior, is about this, how modifications prevent us from experiencing and knowing our true reality. And those modifications have many names, many ways of describing them. But when we boil them all down, they are anything that obscures the awareness's perception of itself. So practically speaking, what does that mean? In this exact moment, what do we perceive? And how do we interpret what we perceive? All of us are in our physical bodies. And most of us, by far the majority of us, have the assumption that this physical body is who we are. And we operate on a moment-to-moment -moment and day-to-day -day basis from that assumption that I am this body and its characteristics define me. And that is a lie. It isn't true. And when you take your spiritual life seriously and you start to really work on awakening your consciousness and clearing it of the misperceptions that it has, you start to experience being awake in your dreams, out of your body. And then you realize that body is not me because in my dream, I was the opposite gender or I was in another country or I had another name. I had a whole other experience, a whole other life. And so you, then you start to really question, who am I? Truthfully, substantially, what is the reality? So yoga is about that. Stilling the modifications. Letting everything come to rest psychologically in us so we can see clearly. Because as we are now, we are a chaos, psychologically speaking. Most people who come to these types of classes have tried to learn to meditate. And those who approach meditation for the first time quickly discover that they cannot make the mind be quiet. They sit, they adopt the posture, they place their attention the way the instructor tells them, but the thinking won't stop. And the pains in the body won't stop. And the fantasies and the daydreaming and the voices that we hear in our heads won't stop. That indicates our psychological situation. Is that psychologically, we're dealing with a chaos a mind that's out of control. That is these modifications. They are not still, they're extremely active and out of control. So to learn yoga, we have to recognize those things and calm down. When we learn that, the awareness starts to become capable of being aware of itself and its true nature and experiencing that and being able to sustain that. Yoga presents a series of steps to make that happen. And that's what the first five lectures of this course were about. People who study Hatha yoga nowadays may have heard a little bit about these things, but they generally don't take them very seriously. They skip steps one and two of yoga, yama and niyama. Pretty much every yoga school in the world skips them nowadays. 
even though they are the first steps. It's like you want to be a doctor, but you don't want to learn English, your ABCs, you don't want to learn how to do math, you don't want to learn to do any of that stuff, you just want to go be a doctor. And it doesn't work like that. Yoga is like that too. You cannot skip any of these steps to really learn what yoga means. These steps, they outline a very scientific process through which anyone who takes it seriously can learn how to still the modifications that prevent awareness from realizing what it really is, from experiencing its true nature. So let me explain a little bit about what that true nature is. We as a human soul, as a consciousness, are a spark that comes out of divinity. Like that first image we saw Surya, that sun god, and that beautiful light, and that beautiful woman gazing at that light. That woman in the image represents the purity that we have within us, that we don't perceive, we're not aware of it, because it's so obscured in the chaos of our day-to-day -day living. When we learn these steps, we learn to, in the first two stages, stop performing actions that cause the chaos of the mind. We learn to stop doing things that create the unsettled mind. That's what yama and niyama are about. In the third step, we learn to sit, to take a posture, and to be fully and completely relaxed, not just physically, but emotionally and mentally as well. So just in the first three stages, someone who really is taking that seriously can make a great deal of progress becoming calm, becoming serene, becoming relaxed. And then in the fourth stage, we learn to harness the energy and take that energy and use it to help advance that relaxation and that stilling, to put the energy to work, all the life energy that we have, the greatest powers that we have, energetically speaking, we put that to work. And by placing attention, concentrating, we learn to hold attention by willpower. Remember I said the human soul's defining characteristic is willpower. Concentration, the ability to pay attention. So whatever tradition we may learn, we learn to concentrate and pay attention. And with all of these prerequisites in place, we've not been doing harmful actions, we're relaxed in our posture, we're harnessing energy and focusing it with our willpower to pay attention and concentrate. From that, we start to withdraw attention from the senses. Pratyahara, this fifth stage, is related to the ability to pay attention to one thing and let the rest become abstract. And gradually, concentration deepens to the sixth stage. And when the concentration deepens and becomes really uh, persistent, that deepens into what is actually called meditation, the actual state of meditation. When the concentration becomes absorbed completely in what we are observing, nothing distracting us, we become completely absorbed in that focus, that concentration. A very specific scientific experience that anyone can have if they learn these stages. And when we access that absorption, going deeper, the consciousness can then access what's called samadhi. That's when the awareness, the consciousness, the human soul is completely liberated from the modifications and experiences its reality. That's why we call it ecstasy, blissfulness. In that state, there is no fear, there is no pride, there is no lust, there is no anger, there is serenity, there is acceptance, there is peacefulness, there is wisdom, there is joy, there is love. Because those are the natural qualities of the human soul. The consciousness is naturally and spontaneously altruistic, diligent, loving, kind, at peace. It is content. 
It is happy for others. It is able to work very hard without seeking reward. These are the natural qualities of the consciousness when it is unmodified, when it is free. And that's why the ancient scriptures describe Adam and Eve as being innocent and beautiful. Naked, meaning they were not covered with the modifications. They were innocent in the Garden of Eden, in perfection, talking with divinity directly. Because there was no modifications preventing them from experiencing their true nature. All of us have that within. But unfortunately, all of us have no clue about it. Because we are deeply buried in modifications. Traumas, pains, sufferings, desires, anger, pride, lust, envy, greed, gluttony. And the list goes on and on. And we think all of that is real. And that it all means something. And we're identified with all of it. This is why we don't experience yoga. Because we are identified. So Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita says, perform action, dwelling in union with the divine, renouncing attachments and balanced evenly in success and failure. Equanimity is yoga. This paragraph, this sentence, sums up the message of the Bhagavad Gita. It's saying, the union occurs when we have an equanimity, psychologically speaking. Equanimity. You could also say equilibrium. You could also say balance. All these words indicate a state of perception, a state of understanding, a state of consciousness. And this doesn't refer to just when you're trying to meditate. It does indicate that. But yoga is not a thing you do 10 minutes a day or an hour a day. Yoga is a lifestyle. It is a way of being. So this equanimity we need, he describes here, renouncing attachments. Most people interpret that as, well, I can't be attached to my car or to my house, or to my clothes, or to my job, or my kids. It does mean those things. But more significantly, not to be attached to your false identity. Not to be attached to your complaints, to your sufferings, to your resentments, to your justifications, to your blaming of others all of the psychological habits that we have that produce the experience that we have. To not be attached. To be balanced instead. Evenly between success and failure. Meaning, whatever happens in life, things go well, things go poorly, we are the same person. We're not jumping for joy and drowning in tears. Sure, we experience emotion, we experience life, but with balance, with equilibrium. Understanding that all things are impermanent, that all things are outside of us are unreliable, and that things will never go the way we dream they will go. Instead, we have our attention on the greater goal, which is union. When our attention, from moment to moment and day to day, is on divinity, we are not affected so much when the bus is running late, when someone is angry, or someone is sad, someone's disappointed in us, someone's blaming us, gossiping about us. We don't take it that seriously. We act, it says here, perform action. Act properly. That's what yama and niyama are about. But we don't become identified. We don't lose touch with who we truly are. So equanimity is implying a way of transforming impressions, a way of dealing with life in which one has a broader perspective of things. So the term that's used here is samadva. 
in Sanskrit. And this word samadva means equality, balance, indifference, undisturbed. When I said that yoga is a way of life, what I'm trying to point out is that if you really want to experience divinity, you have to learn how to meditate. And if you really want to meditate, you have to be training yourself for meditation all day. Because the training time for meditation is not just that 10 minutes or half an hour that you practice. It is the entirety of your daily life. That is your training time. That's when you prepare for meditation. If all day long you are relaxed and attentive, then when you meditate, you're ready. But if all day long your mind is a chaos and you're constantly being swung back and forth between all these different emotional states and disappointment and excitement and being caught up in all the dramas of the day, then when you go to meditate, you'll be exhausted. Your mind will be crazy. You won't be able to relax. You won't be able to concentrate. It will be frustrating. And you'll give up. And that's what happens to most people who try to learn to meditate. They give up precisely because they were not training all day. I put this picture here of Swami Vivekananda because it very nicely demonstrates a beautiful, simple quality of serenity and relaxation. And when you study meditation, obviously, as a meditator, that's the experience that you want to have. You want to be able to go and sit for meditation and feel serene and feel balanced and relaxed. Just understand that you cannot hope to gain it if you're only seeking it during the meditation practice. You have to be working all the time, 24 hours a day, to relax, to transform impressions, to not become identified with all of your experiences, but instead to deal with things equally. If we are identified with the modifications that are influencing us from moment to moment, then we cannot experience our true nature. Awareness, consciousness, is the root of what we are, here and now. It's the root of what we can experience and feel as our inner reality, our inner nature. But let's analyze that. What do you experience when you're frustrated? Think about that. Just remember a moment when you were frustrated. Remember how that makes you feel physically. It changes how you feel physically. You may feel tense. You might feel sick. You might feel like you need to run and do something or you want to hit somebody. You want to choke somebody, your emotional state changes, your mental state changes. Not only that, everything you perceive is perceived through the frustration. You guys get that, right? This is what's a modification. It's a simple example. Frustration. We all get frustrated. We're stuck in traffic, we're stuck on the bus, we're stuck on the train, we're frustrated in our job, we're frustrated in our relationship, we're frustrated with our kids, with our income level, we're frustrated with so many things. Politicians, the system. In other words, we are all identified with a frustrated desire. We want things to be a certain way, and they aren't. So we're angry. Isn't that true? But we all have that in many ways, with many things. That's just one example. What about envy? Our friend or our neighbor or somebody we see in TV has these things that we want and we feel we deserve, and it frustrates us. We deserve that. Why can't I have that? I should have that. I want that. And we're trying to think, the mind's racing. How can I get it? How can I get what that person has? That's envy. In those states, just talking about frustration and envy, 
our consciousness is not experiencing its true nature because its true nature is contentment, peace, serenity, perfectly relaxed, doesn't need anything outside of itself. It is content with itself. So when we feel frustration, we are identified with a modification. We are not abiding in our true nature. We are not in a state of yoga. Now, if we're honest, we can see that most of our lives are spent identified with some modification or another. How many years are we identified with lust? The pursuit of the sensations of lust. Not only physical sensations, but emotional and mental sensations. Chasing after that. Trying to satisfy those desires. And even if we manage to satisfy them for a moment or an instant, a few minutes later, a few hours later, it's back, stronger. What about pride? We always want to be praised, loved, envied, admired. Someone's gossiping about us. Someone's talking bad about us. Don't like it. Going to get revenge. Going to set the record straight. So we wind up pursuing constantly so many different desires and never realizing that in our true nature, right now, the contentment is there. But we don't see it because we're identified with these modifications that are filtering our perception. This is what yoga is about. Recognizing those things for what they are. So this is now we're up to the point where we've reached in the first chapter of the Yoga Sutras, which is line 33, which says, the mind becomes still by cultivating habits of friendliness, mercy, gladness, and indifference towards happiness, pain, virtues, and vices. This sounds like a very strange thing to say, to be indifferent to virtue to be indifferent towards pain. So the mind immediately rushes into all these extreme situations. Well, if I'm getting tortured, I should just be indifferent to it. Or I shouldn't be trying to be patient. Isn't that a virtue? This is not what is meant here. We have to go into the significance of what is stated, not the literal interpretation of these words, but the quality of consciousness it's pointing towards. It doesn't mean that we should not care about our vices and virtues. We absolutely have to care about that. What matters is our inner attitude. The inner attitude, the position of the consciousness. Now, we've just described how in most moments of our lives, we are really identified with all range of desires that we have inside. Many types of frustrations and desires, envy, pride, lust, greed, gluttony, all that stuff. When you reflect on the course of your life, you'll see that your mind is always in this swing, from one side to the other, it's a huge pendulum of feeling very frustrated, then very happy, then very frustrated, then very happy, and there's always swinging in this chaos of chasing after these elusive qualities and never being able to pin it down. You know, we worked for years and years to get our degree, and then we're so happy for a few minutes, and then all of a sudden we're facing the realities of having to get a job and to start a family and all the other factors of life, what happened to those years of work towards the goal? We get it, and then what? Or you work for years to get that promotion, then you finally get it, and you find yourself with a whole new set of problems, and you're still not happy. Or you work for years to get married, you finally get married, then you're suffering even more. Life is like that when you're identified. When you take the perception of the outer world as reality, you will suffer because that is not reality. Reality is inside of us, in that human soul. And when we can center in that, establish equilibrium in that, we can then see all these qualities for what they are and not be a victim of circumstances anymore. That's when we can really have a sense of direction in our lives. Because when you're centered in your true state, your true nature, you start to get guidance from your divinity. 
When you're identified with anger and lust and pride, you can only hear what those qualities are telling you. That's it. You can't hear anything else. When you're angry, you're frustrated, or that you're really chasing after that person that you really want, you can't hear anything else, especially divinity. It's only when the mind is serene, still, like a beautiful lake in the mountains that you can see the stars reflected in it. When that stillness is present in you from moment to moment, you then see the reality of what's going on all around you. And you can respond to it intelligently, not randomly, not chaotically, not driven by karma and desire, but by will. So this state indicated here, the mind becomes still by cultivating habits. This phrase, cultivating habits, means we're needing to transform the way we normally pay attention, to change it. Right now, our habits of attention are very much about me, myself, and what I want, and how I can get it. That's how our mind functions in its current quality. I want what I want, and I'm going to figure out whatever I have to do to get it. If I have to lie, I'm going to lie. If I have to steal, I'm going to steal. I'm going to do whatever it takes. Meanwhile, I'm going to try to make everybody think I'm a saint. But inside, I'm going to manipulate things and change things to get that desire fulfilled. When instead we're practicing yoga, we're cultivating a new attitude, a new inner attitude. And in that inner attitude, we're no longer focused on the desires of the mind, the desires of the ego. But instead, we're focused on yoga, trying to establish that stillness, inner stillness, so we can see the reality of what's really going on around us. That is an attitude. It is an action. It is a type of behavior in which we use the consciousness to be here and now at all times, and perceiving here and now at all times. As we are now, ruled by desires, we see other people as mechanisms to use for our desires. The ego sees people that way. The ego sees others as ways to satisfy our lust. We don't see a person. We don't see a human being. We see a measurement of how that person relates to our lust. When we have a lot of craving for money or craving for power in our job or whatever, when we go to work, we don't see human beings at work. We see stepping stones. We see how each person fits into our scheme, our strategy to get ahead. Oh, that guy works in the mailroom. I don't have to talk to him because he can't help my career. Isn't it true? We all do this on some level, depending on the nature of our own modifications. We treat people according to how our desires function. Look at it this way. When you go to work, you're super polite around your boss and the person who's in charge of the company. But the people who are ranked lower than you, you can ignore them. Who cares what they think? But the boss, oh yeah, because that's the one with power. That's who can change your life. And that's wrong. Instead, if we develop this mind of a yogi, this first habit, friendliness, it's towards all people, all creatures, all living things, equally. No exceptions. And we, our mind says, what? But if we really compare our behaviors and we look at the lives of the great masters, we realize, yeah, Jesus would treat everyone exactly the same. But Moses, the Buddha, Krishna, they see the human soul in people. They're not seeing through the filter of their egos and their desires. They're seeing the reality. 
They see that each person is suffering. They see that each person has their own problems, their own traumas, their own pain. They see the reality of those people. They don't see them as tools. That's how we look at these. Mercy in the same way, gladness in the same way, indifference towards these qualities. Instead of pursuing them as desires, we need to pursue them indifferently. So equanimity, more detailed. That word friendliness is maitri. And it means to have a good, a good way of perceiving everyone and looking at everyone as being the same as you. Looking out at everyone and not being modified any longer by ambition, envy, greed, not trying to compete with others, to step over others. And this is in huge ways and in little ways. You're rushing for the subway and you're elbowing past people. You're competing to get first on the train. Why? Because you think you're more important. But you don't know the reality. That person that you shut out and you, feel, you, get, you jump on the train and you shut somebody out and they're left on the platform and you're laughing to yourself. <laughs> I got right in there right ahead of that guy and now he's stuck waiting there. You may not realize that that guy was on his way to the doctor to get medication. He's sick. You may not know that. You may not know that guy's dying. You may not know he's going to the bedside of someone who's dying. You don't know. Oftentimes the things that we do that we think are so good are evil. And we just don't realize it because we don't see the truth. We don't even think to think about that, to question ourselves and our behaviors. It doesn't even occur to us that the way we behave has a tremendous impact on everyone including ourselves. That's what's indicated in these passages, is this need to really question and learn to behave in a better way. So there are three words that are given here, Maitri, Karuna, and Mudita. And in general, they all mean the same thing. Abandon, pride, and anger, and greed, and all these qualities that are about you and yourself, me and myself, and change that. To have a more expansive perception, a more loving attitude towards others. Now, all of this sounds like it's about our terrestrial life, and it is in the first decree. Because when we're working with the first stages of yoga, uh, yama and niyama, we're trying to learn to improve our behaviors in our physical life and in our interactions with others. But these qualities are only really developed when they become cognizant, conscious. And for us to fully develop them, we have to have these attitudes spontaneously and naturally inside, not imposed on us as external behaviors, but as qualities that just happen because we just are that way. You see the difference? To really be a loving person is different from acting like one. And we all know that. You know that person that you go and you see at work or at this and that place, they always smile, but you know it's fake. They always say, hey, how are you doing? But you know they're lying. You know it's all fake. They just do it because they have to. But have you ever met a person who, for no need or reason, was so sincerely kind to you and so sweet to you that you never forgot it? And they had no need to be that way. No reason. They just were, because that's just how they are. That is what we need if we want to learn yoga and meditation, is to become like that. Not forced to be a certain way, but doing it because that's what we do. These are summarized in that passage with the word upeksana, which in Sanskrit is a little tricky to, to translate to English. Most of the time you see it translated as indifference. And to us, we hear the word indifference and we think it means we don't care. It's a coldness or a cruelty. That's not what's meant here. What's meant by this term is that we see what it is and we don't have a preference one way or the other. There's a difference there. 
It's not cold. It isn't ignoring. It isn't cruel. It simply is not having a preference one way or the other. It just says, it is what it is. Sometimes it's said, as it is. And this is a a way to remind oneself of how to position the consciousness for meditation, but also for self-observation and self-remembering. As it is means you see it as it is and you don't try to change it. You just observe it. You're aware of it. But you don't have a preference for it being one way or the other way. Now, in the scripture, it's, it breaks this down as indifference towards sukha, dukkha, punya, apunya, which, of course, in Sanskrit is poetic, rhyming words. But in English, these mean pleasure and displeasure, virtue and vice, happiness and pain, good and evil. The passage is not saying that we should not care about good and evil. It's not saying that we should be uh, cold or cruel or not care about whether we are good or bad or someone else is good and bad. It's not saying that. It's saying we need to learn to observe things as they are and not have a preference for one or the other. Because when we do have a preference, we cloud our judgment. We no longer see the truth. When you want things to be a certain way and they're not, you ignore the reality and you become frustrated. We all know that. So this passage is significant for the meditation practice, for the effort to develop meditation. This is precisely that inner attitude that one has to have to establish pratihara, dharana, and dhyana. It is this quality of indifference. So what does that mean, practically speaking? After the class, we're going to meditate. Everyone will take a posture, and I'll give you the instruction to relax. So you will take a position, you will relax your body, you will close your eyes, and we will start to simply pay attention. But your body will complain. You will feel discomfort. You will feel bored. You want to go eat. You want to go out. Your leg is hurting you. Your arm is hurting. Your back is hurting. Your neck is hurting. Whatever it is, all kinds of sensations happen. Somebody's talking in the next room, and you can hear them, and it's annoying you. Or this dumb song keeps repeating in your head, and it won't stop. All kinds of different phenomena will happen. And if you're not paying attention, you'll become frustrated or distracted. But if you have this quality, upeksana, equanimity, then you can look at all of those phenomena and say to yourself, in a manner of speaking, so what? It is what it is. So my knee hurts. So someone's talking. So I can hear the bus. So I can hear the train. So that person next to me smells terrible. So what? It is what it is. That is the door to equanimity. That's what's indicated here. To not have a preference, but instead to be attentive and withdraw from that identification. Because otherwise you'll start thinking, oh, maybe I should get up and go out there and tell them to shut up. Or maybe I need to tell that person to go home and take a shower. Or maybe I need to just stretch my legs out. Maybe I need to just scratch that itch. All of those responses are identification with the experience. They are where the mind is no longer under will of consciousness. The mind is now in control. The mind is saying, I I don't like this, I want to change it. Let's go. Let's get out of here. That's mind pursuing a desire. When the consciousness is in control, it says, no. I'm here to meditate, to pay attention, to relax. You, mind, shut up. I'm not paying attention to you. And you withdraw from that. So what's happening there, both in our terrestrial life when we do this sort of thing and in our meditation life when we do this thing, we are withdrawing power from all of those factors that control us right now. 
we are starting to center our power in will. And that's how we develop will power. It is the power of the human soul to be in charge of one's own life. In, that, in the Bible, that human soul is represented by David, that little boy who doesn't have anything but faith. He remembers God. It's all he's got. But that remembrance, that attentiveness, is what gives him the power to conquer the Philistines. We all have that. The Philistines are the mind itself. All of those desires, those very powerful enemies that are in our minds. Our pride is not our friend. Our anger is not our friend. Our lust is not our friend. They are our jailers. They are what cause us to suffer. And every religion's pointed that out. If we really want to escape suffering, we have to break free of that prison that we ourselves made. In the context of meditation, it means that you as the meditator have to take the power away from those elements. And this is through developing equanimity. Equanimity is when we center the power from moment to moment in acceptance, in cognizance, being here and now. Not letting external things or internal things choose our behaviors at random, but instead we choose them purposefully and with intelligence. So in the practice of meditation, what this means is that we sit to meditate, we relax, so we're in our physical body, which here on the Tree of Life is represented by Malkut, our physicality. We close our eyes. At this point, Anyone who really wants to learn to properly reach dhyana, which is the actual state of meditation, to, to learn that, to really become an effective meditator, you begin by shutting down all the senses, taking attention out of them. That means you place your body in a physical posture, you relax it, and then you forget about it. That means your posture has to be good. You need a posture where your body can sit there and just rest and not bother you and not be a pain and not be a needy baby always calling for your attention. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. My knee hurts. None of that. You have to be in control of your body. Be in charge of it. Put it to meditate and make it stay there. Not with, not with tension, but to be relaxed, like you're going to take a nap. You put it there, you rest it. In other words, you take attention away from physicality. If there are sounds in the room, you might hear them, you might not. You don't care. You are indifferent. It might be too cold, it might be too hot, there might be somebody talking. So what? You withdraw the power of those things to control you. The same with the astral body, the body of emotion, which is related with hod. Emotions come and go. Not only emotions, but dreams. You never notice that when you start to take a nap, you're relaxing, and after a few minutes, these images start to drift in, and before you know it, you're dreaming? That is hod. That's the astral body. Same happens when you meditate. When you become relaxed, really getting relaxed, really getting peaceful, then these images start floating by, that's hod. You have to also develop the capacity to see that for what it is and not become identified. Because you will. You'll start, oh, oh, I left those bills on the table, and we start daydreaming about this and that, and we should go here and there, and all these things that we want and don't want. And soon enough, the meditation's over, and we didn't do anything but daydream the whole time. If you can learn to see those things for what they are and not be identified with them, then you can go even deeper to where the thoughts are flowing. That's netzah, related with this sephira. Again, withdrawing attention, not becoming distracted, 
not becoming identified with any thought. Thought comes, it passes. This takes concentration. It takes awareness. You can see these are getting more subtle, right? More subtle. If you can successfully disengage from thinking as well, then you're centering yourself here in Tiferet, which is will, which is human soul, which is perception. This is just willpower, concentration. The person who is working in this way effectively, withdrawing attention from all of those distractions and centering in concentration, is the one who's working through pratyahara, dharana, and dhyana on those stages of yoga. And the one who is able to sit in meditation, paying attention, without being distracted at all, not forgetting they're meditating, but having attention placed on what they place it on for the length of their meditation time, they have established concentration. They have reached dharana. Now, those of you who have studied the Tibetan Buddhist stages of meditative concentration, shamatha, know that what I'm talking about are the levels from four, five, and up on those nine stages. It compares very clearly with this. I'm showing it to you on the Tree of Life. It's the same exact teaching. Yoga, Buddhism, Kabbalah, they're all saying exactly the same thing. It's centering attention in willpower, placing attention. This needs to become our center of gravity. Center of gravity. Contemplate what that means. To have a center of gravity means to be balanced. Now let's visualize that we are on a tightrope. Just imagine that feeling, being on a tightrope. And you need to be very relaxed. If you tense up or have a big reaction, you'll fall. If you become emotional, you'll fall. If you become distracted, you'll fall. You have to be very relaxed. So that tightrope is this moment. And that rope itself is the path of yoga. But it isn't a rope. It's a razor blade. So if you think about standing on a razor blade over an abyss, that's a dramatic scene. And if you're standing on a razor blade and you're really heavy, you will be sliced in half. Heavy meaning full of desires, full of materialism, full of thoughts of myself and my pleasures and what I want. You will be sliced in half. But if you're very light, empty, not attached, present, relaxed, and contented, you can walk carefully, step by step. That's why the yogis called this the path of the razor's edge. One needs a very specific type of attitude to be able to walk on it. Now contemplate this a little further. You're standing on this very delicate tip, balanced. How many different ways can you fall? Any direction, right? Any direction. But where is your center of balance? In one place. One. There are no options. If you're balanced on that very narrow, very sharp edge, you can't lean left or right or forward or back. You have to be exactly positioned, but very relaxed. This visual, this imaginative tool conveys the precise position of the consciousness that is necessary for you to develop in meditation. It is extremely precise. 
It is not vague. It is not open to interpretation. You can't just get there figuring it out on your own. It is a science. It's as if the people that study meditation and yoga nowadays think that they can approach it in this way, that they can just figure it out on their own and make up their own technique. It's as if they want to cure cancer by going into the pharmacy and picking out whatever they want. They're dying of cancer, and they don't want to take all those other medications. They only want to take the one that tastes like cherry flavor, the one that has a lot of sugar in it. Spirituality does not work like that. Medicine doesn't work like that. If you want to cure your condition, there is an exact cure. But it has to be pre applied precisely, or you will not be cured. Yoga is like that. That position is here, Tiferet. That single point of balance that leads to liberation. You can call the path anything you want. You can call it yoga or dharma or religion. They all mean the same thing. They're all coming from the same place. They're expressing the same thing. Equanimity, equilibrium, psychological balance. To have a permanent center of gravity in the human soul, which is Tiferet, which is here and now in the consciousness. It's not in the future. It's not in the past. It's here and now. It's to be actively present and engaged, but in a very balanced way. And to develop that in oneself is not easy. It is not easy. It takes a lot of training. But if you're studious with the science, you can learn it. That point of balance, the center of gravity that we need, is not outside of us. It isn't in anything, anywhere in the universe except right here, right now. So that's where we have to always be focused, in the present moment, developing this inner equanimity. And from that point of balance, we observe everything around us and learn to discriminate, learn to interpret. Because you see, the consciousness is the basis of perception, but it is also the basis of understanding. It is how we understand, how we comprehend what we see. Real meditation starts here in Tiferet. Everything up to that point is preliminary. Someone who's developed that center of gravity, even for an instant, even to access that for a moment, you will know it. Because it's a distinct experience from our terrestrial experience, the way most of us live nowadays. It is very distinct. It has unique characteristics. And you will know it when you experience it. My recommendation to you is to take this and make it practical. Find what it is that causes you to be out of equilibrium. What is it that causes you to become identified? And learn to become indifferent towards the things that make you identified. Most people who pursue the study of meditation are pursuing the experience of a state of consciousness. And that's their mistake. That's where things go bad. When we're pursuing an experience, that's a desire. And that very pursuit can become an obstacle. So our approach to meditation is different. We describe the state so that we understand them. But we are not recommending that you pursue a state of consciousness, that you chase after it, that you, that you are actively trying to acquire it. Because that's how desire corrupts the process. Our real focus should be not on chasing after the state of meditation, but instead finding what prevents it. The state of meditation actually is our natural state. Every one of us, if we were in our original natural state, would be able to meditate easily anytime at will, no problem. But we can't because of the modifications that we created in our psyche. So the way to learn to meditate is to find those modifications and break their power over us. 
That's how we learn to meditate. It's not by chasing after samadhi, by chasing after dharana or dhyana or these other states. It's instead turning the attention towards what's preventing it. Do so you have any questions? Um, so if... I'm just saying, T for red, center in the heart, right? Mm -hmm. So if you don't chase the state of existing from T for red, but you work to become equanimous, then um, when you're analyzing your thoughts and everything like that, or, for example, using the mantra uh, from Master Samael about accessing the Akashic, the Akashic uh, mm -hmm. records, how does that relate to desire, you know? Because then why, why am I seeking to go to the Akashic records? Like, what am I searching for? Is that attached to desire? And how does that relate to being centered in the heart? That's exactly the conflict you have to work out, isn't it? It's exactly that. To figure out what is it that I'm chasing and why. And if I'm chasing something, is it because I don't already have it? You do. We all have it. But we've lost touch with it. So it's a, it's a philosophical... You have to invert our way of looking at things, basically. To, to really become aware of what we're paying attention to and why. Yeah. Another question? In your last lecture, you brought up a uh, principle in quantum physics about how you observe something changes it. Now, sometimes when you try to observe your mind, it's almost like the yeah. ego hides. You can't see what you want to see. It kind of goes away. But kind of like if that applies to the ego as well when you're trying to observe it. Does it change it? Does Always. It, how do we remedy that? And how do we keep the focus on what we want to, what we're trying to figure out? So the, the question is, is very good. When we pay attention to something, we change it. Specifically the mind, when we try to observe the mind or the ego, it hides itself. So how do we get around that? Well, you have a great advantage as a soul in that the ego is 100% mechanical. It thinks it's clever because it's trapped most of our power and it wants to keep it. But the ego has an incredible weakness, which is that it is rooted in desire. It is ruled by desire, not God, not the being. You can use that to your advantage. So the way to overcome the trickiness of the ego is to utilize the powers of the consciousness and to be clever in working with how the ego is a mechanical process. So for example, when you try to catch a mouse in your house, it's very difficult. Because if you make a noise, you make a sound, it will hide. But if you're very still, that thing cannot overcome its craving. It will come out because it wants the food that it's chasing. But if you just wait, it will show up. So that's the first way in meditation to really gain the ability to perceive the sneakiness of the ego. It is to be patient. Sometimes if you chase it, it will only hide deeper. It will only do its best to escape even deeper into the, the labyrinth. But if you're just patient and you just wait there, it will come out. It can't help itself. Yes, sir. Yes. You know, Buddhism, they use the word endeavor a lot. Uh, Lama, Which word? Endeavor. Okay. Dalai Lama always uses it as a commentary on the Tapapada or the Boycha Vitara. And he's just finding joy in doing what's good. Yes. Okay. So also Buddhism teaches non-attachment, and you talk about uh, perfection, right? All the great big difference. So I was trying to find joy. You said don't go up and down, right? So how do you find joy in doing what's good as a non-attachment? The whole of the Bhagavad Gita is about that, the yoga of action. How to act indifferently. And so Krishna, in chapter after chapter, goes around that whole phenomena philosophically in, in such a beautiful way. And it's a very subtle thing to understand because only the consciousness can do it. The mind can't understand it. And the essence of it is the consciousness itself exists in order to act. It doesn't exist just to be a passive observer of suffering. 
It exists in order to actively transform life. And that's true for all of us. We're here for a reason. We're not here to just let suffering happen, to let the world decay. We're here to fight, to be a warrior. That's why it's called the great warrior, the Mahabharata. We need to become that. But we cannot be that if our perception is clouded. So part of having right perception or right view is the ability to perceive things as they truly are and then be able to act accordingly. If we have a preference in our point of view, if we're attached towards seeing things in a certain way or we're seeking to see things in a certain way, we can't see the truth. This is a very subtle point of balance there in knowing how to perceive and then act on that perception. It's not something that can be easily answered. There's no like golden rule that answers how does one act on the path because one's action always depends on the reality that you're facing. To do this action now may be right, but it may also be completely wrong. And that's why we say that sometimes on this path, virtues are a good thing and sometimes they're a bad thing. You have to learn to have them active in the right places at the right times. The joy is not an emotion, it's action. The joy that we find is in right action. It's knowing when that action is the exact right action. And only the being in us, that connection to the innermost, can provide that intuitive knowing. Can guide the soul. Now, do it. It's not something the intellect can ever know. It can't be written in a book. You know, okay, like all the astrologers think that's what they're giving you. The astrologers are saying, okay, on this date, at this time, you need to get married, you need to do this and that and this and that. It doesn't work like that. There are influences from the stars, of course. But knowing how to act in the right way at the right time... Intellect doesn't have that power. The emotional body doesn't have that power. The vital and physical bodies certainly don't have that power. But the human soul does when it's connected to the innermost. So in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna explains this repeatedly and repeatedly to do all action as service to divinity. And what's implied there is that if you're going to act on behalf of God, you have to know what God wants. And we, as we in our current condition, don't know that. But if we activate the human soul and we make it our center of gravity, we can start to know that. Firstly, intuitively, we start to sense it. It's a kick in the heart. Do it. Don't do it. You'll just know. It's like a sense of right and wrong. It's a, it's a subtle feeling. That's how it begins. And eventually it becomes very powerful. But we have to make space in ourselves for that sense to, to be born and to grow. Any other questions? Is it practically knowing how to deal with karma? Absolutely. To practically deal with karma, you have to know how to behave and at the right time. When to speak and when not to speak. When to act and when not to act. The ego doesn't know that. That's why we, our lives are a mess. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah, Lord,